So you love podcasts and you want to listen to more amazing content, but you have no idea what to listen to. And your friends keep telling you about great episodes, yet you can never remember what they told you. Well, here's the answer. Good Pods. It's the social app dedicated to podcasts where your friends, podcast listeners, and favorite podcast hosts all come together to share on their feeds what they recommend and what they listen to. You can connect to others, bookmark episodes, start a conversation about the episode, connect to the hosts, and most importantly, listen to great podcasts right in the Good Pods app. Download Good Pods wherever you get your apps and start sharing with a community that loves to listen. Good Pods, it's where to connect and listen. It's time to take an inside look at those that are taking their lives, their businesses, and their passions to the next level. Get ready to thrive loud with Lou Diamond. Flip it over. Yeah, we're going live. Welcome everyone to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond. Connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. And today on our show, we have certified speaking professional, motivational speaker, author, and virtual presenter. He is all about navigating disruption, enhancing leadership, and expanding inclusion. Most notably, the last time he was on this show was right at the beginning of COVID-19 when sporting events were being canceled and we were trying to figure out what the world was all about. And he signed off the show by saying, hey, Lou, speak to your next tragedy. And and I didn't think we would ever have to do that. But with what's going on in the world and the relevance of what he is all about and what he speaks about, I wanted to have a conversation with this powerful individual, Thrive Lab listeners and viewers here on Facebook and on YouTube, Tony Chapman. Tony, how are you, my friend? I'm good, Lou. How are you doing? I'm good. I think we'd all like to be a little better, right? I think that's the the way we would love to position this. Yeah, and I think when I say I'm good, I'm probably overstating what I really am, but I'm just going to go with that for now. Can can I tap into that? I I think, um, look, at the time of this, for the listeners out there, time we're recording this, uh, this is early June, uh, obviously, Days after the awful incident happening in Minnesota and and several uh, protests and tragedies happening everywhere across the United States, um, where there are acts of violent violence or protests or people trying to speak and trying to get get a grip of what's going on. Uh, Yesterday was Tuesday. We just had um, basically blackout Tuesday on on social media where where everyone was really trying to, to hit this. So, one, I want to take your temperature and see see where you're at. And, and I also wanted to say that I wanted to have these conversations because this is what I can do. I am, I am a white male. I am somebody who who cares though about equality, who cares about seeing the right things being done, and hate seeing what's going out there. Um, but I am not black, and and you are, as you have used to say on your speeches all the time. For those of you who don't know me, I'm black. Um, and I think I wanted our perspective. I want the conversation to happen, and that's why I wanted you on Thrive Out today. So first of all, thank you for being here. And Absolutely. Tell me, tell me where you're at and, and where you're feeling and, and, and I guess what's front and center for you right now. So someone just asked me in one word to describe how I'm doing, and I said exhausted. I'm exhausted physically, mentally, emotionally. We have been cooped up for 10 weeks in quarantine with more than my that. wife. <laughs> two, so, yeah, more than that probably. So March 13th was when I started with wife, two kids, two adult kids, dog and a cat in a two-bedroom condo because we downsized. We're dealing with a pandemic. We are dealing with a world that is going through civil unrest. I have uh, watched as Ahmaud Aubrey was murdered on, mm-hmm. you know, it was recorded. I watched as Amy Cooper, just without hesitation, called the police on a black male three miles from my house um, for checking her on not having a leash on a dog. And then I watched the next day as a man 
was suffocated for eight hour, eight minutes and 53 seconds, which juxtaposed with Amy Cooper was easily could have been the repercussions of that phone call. I, the same time, my wife on Thursday had to attend a funeral virtually of her aunt, her mm. deceased mom's last sister, because her aunt and um, her aunt's husband just died from COVID-19. Um, I spent the last five days just trying to correct people's perspective on world events. Uh, yeah. And I'm sleeping about three and a half hours a day. I'm, I'm pretty exhausted. Well, well, first of all, as a personal friend and all that, best to your wife and the family. I'm so sorry to hear about that. And obviously, nice. and, and these virtual funeral things also make it uh, make closure and all that so difficult with everything. Yeah. Um, Tony, the, Correcting maybe people's perspective of what's going on there, because I because I also I agree with you that that a lot of people, because of the way we see things, either via the news or social media or the way things get reported, it is it is hard to get the true perspective of even the factual perspective. And that's always been an issue. Um, But there's also, as you speak about unconscious bias, there's. There's short term memory and maybe not really knowing all the facts and and maybe even a little revisionist history, too, which happens with all of this. Uh, help help set the record straight with 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 me and with our listeners here on how you've been helping people set the record straight, because I think that'll be good to, to really clarify that and where you're at now. Well, for me, a lot of it has been, you know, so I've been on Facebook nonstop for the last you know, I don't know, five days. Yeah, I think just so. Just feeding out information because it's been, I, you know, I have a lot of channels of information that it's, you're seeing this reported by mainstream media, but what you're not seeing is this. You're seeing protesters and looters and thinking they're the same thing, but you're not seeing videos of agitators show up and doing this. You're seeing people go into dis, you know, quote, disorder when responding to police, but you're not realizing they're responding to tear gas because yeah. tear gas disorients and burns and it's not like pepper spray. It's what I'm really trying to do is bring as much fact and at the same time get into conversations that I may have let slide two weeks ago, but realizing thousands of people are looking at that conversation and correcting facts. You know, I may not correct all the perspectives. I don't know if that's super important, but first I've got to correct the facts. We can, we can have differences of opinion, but we cannot have differences of fact and of truth. So that's been a lot of what I've done from that standpoint. I'll tell you this, this is something that, that, that I've had a better eye of, for instance, um, here in New York city on Sunday evening, uh, there was a fire that started down in union square and amazingly, they they found some white supremacist. They inter- they arrested this person who started this fire, who basically is trying to agitate. And of course, that isn't what gets reported right away. Uh, there's some lunatic down in Atlanta who's driving a, ca- a car into a peaceful situation. And and what what frustrates me, Tony, is when I see these reports. The only report you're hearing is that the looting is happening, right? And that the rioting is happening and that the fire is happening, but they're not hitting it that it's being started in certain ways. And that's what's driving me a little crazy um, because um, one of the best pieces of footage I've ever seen, it, it's an awful scene, but there's a woman who went into a shop right that was being looted and she was filming what was happening and she was saying that this is not right. People, she was actually you know, discouraging people to come in and you're getting her two cents of it. And you're never hearing that story. So part of having these conversations is to make sure all the stories are, are presented and not the ones that seem to just make it seem like it's a violent reaction to something. What's your yeah, Can I even that? add on that? Yeah. Well, not, not only not to seem like it's a violent reaction of it, but not the story that confirms what you already believe. Correct. Because what a lot of people are doing is they are hearing or seeing or feeding themselves information that confirms their previous belief. 
So if you believe that when a bunch of black people get together and protest, that that always results in a riot, then that's the information stream that you're going to go for. And anything else that you see from that, you've got to twist it and manipulate it in a way that it can be what you want it to be. You don't want to change your worldview. You just want to change your source of information. And that's really been a lot of the challenge because you know, this is what I talk to, not just not just corporate entities. I talk to the federal government and the law enforcement about this topic. So this is very near and dear to my heart. But to to really break this down for people and to say, look, you you have to get different information. So that's why even that video you, you just mentioned, that video you just mentioned, I posted you know a copy of that. I posted that because you know I had a friend who was at that protest you just mentioned. Right. Where the woman threw the Molotov cocktail into the police car right. and you were that police van or that truck van, whatever, dashed into the barricade. Mm-hmm. My friends were standing there 15 minutes prior. OK, mm-hmm. but what's interesting and what I've been really telling people, just like what you said, you know, I got to do what I can do. What I've been telling people is, hey, look, like, for example, my friend who was there, she's a filmmaker. She had been taking video. I said, you got two hours of video. You need to post what it was like before that moment right. because it was peaceful. It was you had people at every corner handing out water and granola bars and, and taking care of the protesters. And it was multiracial. But that's not what you're seeing. You're seeing sensationalism. And so getting every person to do their part and to utilize their voice is so important right now. It's so funny you say that because about two weeks ago, I saw um, the Black Klansman by Spike Lee, and if you do, you saw the movie. You did see it, of course. Yes, right. okay. I shouldn't say of course, but yes, I saw. Yeah, it. No, but you saw. Um, at the end of the movie, he provided footage from what happened in Virginia, right by the University of Virginia, when those riots were happening by the the uh, Charlottesville. Riots, by yeah, Charlottesville. Thank you, and he showed a footage I'd never seen before of, of a car just ramming through and crashing into people, innocent. I never seen that footage before. And I saw it in the, mo- in, in the movie. And I said, did I not see that in the movie because the media chose me, chose not to show that, or it just never came across, or maybe it was just too graphic and violent for television. Very possible. Um, or maybe I'm going to the wrong news sources. And, and, and I, that's the other problem is I don't even know where to go to get the right information because what we, what we want there When there's universal acceptance of something that we can all understand, like the terrible acts that the police officer had in Minnesota, nobody has any questions that that is dead wrong. That guy needs to be prosecuted the fullest extent of the law. But there's the it's these the wave effects of everything else that's happening that I feel that we can never get the right consistent level of viewing of that communication. Tony, the question I guess I have is where do we go from here and what what can we all be doing better every day because you have you have a show which I'll, I'll give the plug here because like I, I I thought of all this when you you and your buddy do a show about did that just happen and um and I and I can't believe the world that we live in either that this is what's going on but I want to be able to figure out how we can make it better And I figured maybe the two of us could just have a conversation about steps we could start to take, things we should start doing. What are the things that you think we could be doing? No pressure. Well, let's yeah, yeah, let's let's start back. Yeah, no pressure at all. Let's start back with that source of information and what's good news and what's not. Because even though that that video you mentioned of Charlottesville, I've seen that video footage many times. So the fact that you have it. I think uh, is a clear indication that we don't have good media sources yeah. and media has gotten lazy. Honestly, it's, it's a shame. So before I post something, I am doing a lot of research to confirm it. And I've learned you can't just confirm it on media sites. Cause I've done that before. And then found out half an hour later after I posted it, that it was still fake. Right. So, you know, really doing your research before you digest information is really important right now. I think that there's a reality that, okay, all of us can do something. I mean, really, all of us, all of us have the ability to do something. And, you know, there are some people, they are activists. And what they can do is they can go out and they can march and they can influence. They have 
energy and they have power and they, they never get tired of doing that. And so, yo, go do that. You know, some people are organizers and, and they can, you know, round up people. Go do that. But here's what the thing is. All of us have a circle of influence. And my thing is, you may not be an activist or an organizer, but you know people. Yeah. And let me say this, because this is really important. You said, you know, we can all agree that the murder was atrocious and wrong. Unfortunately, we cannot. Like if we, I've dug into my Facebook feed beyond what the algorithm constantly sends me. And I found those little crevices of people who are like, well, you know, that's what you got to do to those people. So that that <laughs> is a, well, but you know, here's the thing. That is a, a reality of our society, which we can't ignore. And because we have maybe a certain friend group and our social media feed has, you know, a certain algorithm, we can start to believe that the whole world is turning and I promise you, the whole world is not turning. So going back to that, you know, you have a very sp specific set of circles of influence, right? Whether it's your, your podcast audience, whether it is your fellow Cornelian alumni, whether it is people in your speakers association, and really influencing them. And like, I'll tell you what I did. So I, had a, uh, I got a text on Friday from a good friend. And he kind of wrote, wrote this really detailed, thought out response from, you know, his perspective of all that's going on. And I said, OK, so this looks like it's like a real response, not a text. What did you do? Because well, I posted it on, you know, our, our organization site. Now, backing up, he's a law enforcement executive. He hey. recently retired because, you know, he was up for a presidential appointee. That's the kind of person he is. I said, okay, here's the problem. The world needs to see this, not just your organization. You're preaching to the choir. And so, A, I spent time convincing him that's what needed to be done, and then literally walking him through how to turn this into a LinkedIn article, and then how to hashtag it, and then how to share it. To the, and it's gained traction, but it was just like, I know this person. That's my influence. That's what I can do. You know, I got up Saturday, Sunday morning and exhausted, thinking, okay, I think I've talked to everybody. I thought, oh, my basketball chat group, which I you know, moved away, I don't play with them that much anymore, but let me see what they're thinking. And that's, rele that's very relevant because 60% of that group is NYPD. And so I needed to, okay, and they're all like, you know, something seems to be wrong, but you know, it, I drove past that, it didn't look right. And I just started building a case that by the time they were done, they're like, okay, you nailed this on the head, we get it. And because some of them are detectives and sergeants and they have influence, I was like, how do I influence influencers? Not everyone can do that, but you know what? Everybody knows somebody. I agree with that. How are they doing? Yeah. What, what, what can you, what do they think? Start having, you're their trusted source and, and you're their safe space. Maybe you should get in there and have conversations of, you know, so what are you thinking? How are you feeling? And be, begin to, because they'll be more op open with you than other people, instead of judge it, shift it so that it starts to go in the right direction. Let me ask this. This is a tough one. This is a challenge. Um, look, if, if, if I have a conversation about the inequities that are happening and I am a white person, we used to have this belief that we could say all the things that we wanted to, but the reality is since we're not being persecuted in this particular instance and in what's being happening. Who are we to say something? But, but I don't agree with that. I agree that everybody has to say something. What's your thoughts on that? So here's the reason things are turning. And you just saw in Philadelphia, the police talked about some reforms, right? Why did it happen? Because it's not just black people marching. I mean, that, that's the reality. It's not just, it's, if you look at the actual marches, they are multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-age, multi-orientation, multi-gendered. It is a collective and that collective has power. But if all of the white people or all of the women or all of the LGBTQIA community or all of any demographics says, you know, it's not my place to say anything that loses power and momentum. You may not always know the right thing to say, but you got to say something. So here's a hard one. Um, 
because of COVID and the situation that we've been in, where so many people are, not, are out of work, there are a lot of students and kids, obviously, are either done or school or didn't even have to be in school. Um, and let's call it what it is, specifically in the Northeast or certain areas, things have been still shut down and not fully opened where they were. Do you think that that kind of gave an extra oomph to the frustration and the level of communication that's going on? Oh, absolutely. Not only the frustration, but people have nothing else to do but sit in their house. It's not, you know, it's not like, oh, you know, I was out playing golf with my friends and we hit the bar and I came home and saw this horrible killing on the internet. It's like you've got nothing else to do but sit in your house and look at this thing and see it happen and this is how it's going and now you got to research it and now you're stuck. Oh, maybe I'll get away from it by getting on my social media. Oh, nope, it's there too. Can't get away there. And I think that the exasperation of it, the anxiousness of it, and the fact that you just can't escape it, uh, all of it played into it. It's almost like if you ever see the movie Do the Right Thing, right? Yeah, Which is of very appropriate for now yeah. that, you know, it ends in a police killing and a riot. But it starts with everyone being exasperated because of the summer temperature that you needed some other catalyst to really push this thing over the edge. So as we, we hope, look, we hope things, I, I, there's part of me that says I want things to cool down from obviously acts of violence or, or things like that. Yes. But regarding all the, the gatherings, but I mean, I've got more messages that highlight the ridiculous number of cases that have happened of unfair deaths from police, from the police force to minorities, specifically black men, more so than anything else. I know that's been the highest part of it. Um, I've got two questions here. One is uh, how, how can we, how, how do we take all of this and, and try to elevate it even more? Why does this, why can't this be the, this is it, the last point? How do we get this to be the last one and then re-educate the police department? How can that happen? Because that seems to not be happening. That obviously time and time again, things keep repeating each other. It's because something isn't being changed on the law enforcement side. I, I wanted your, your two cents. And the reason I'm asking your two cents was a conversation that I'd overheard you had. If it's okay, I share the story that you had had a conversation with your son about how to interact with the police. Can you share on both of those topics? And I know I asked a lot. Of sure. You, that's okay. So I think me, people misinterpreted that post. Okay. Um, that was not a conversation about how to interact with police. That was more my son looking at all this and just being fed up and venting. And, you know, I needed to calm him down. Okay. Um, now I say that because as a black father of a, 22 year old and 19 year old son. If I'm waiting till now to have that conversation about how to interact with the police, I'm a horrible dad. That's a conversation we've had a decade ago. Right. You know, they've already both been profiled. Okay. This is, so I, I think that's, and I, so it's a correction, but it's also a, no, this is far worse. It's almost like if you look at, there's a post I shared where someone asked, and they're really asking black people, um, so when's the first time the police ever pulled a gun on you? And you watch the stream of, 15, 17, 12, 11, you know, and people are like, that's not our reality. So, you know, that's a, and if that's a, an absolute norm. And if you actually look at the comment stream and uh, when I posted that about my son, you know, it's a very different reaction. The people who are white were like, oh my gosh, why? and people who are black were like, bro, why didn't you have the conversation before? And I'm like, right. yo, come on, you know, <laughs> I had the conversation way earlier. So that's the different worlds that we live in. In terms of police reform, so this gets very interesting. One of the things is, okay, you know, the good cop, bad cop narrative, right? Are the majority of cops good? Yeah. Are there bad apples? Yeah. Do the bad apples ever get real repercussions? No. Then they're enabled to continue to be bad apples. Right. Okay, so that, that's... That's problem number one. So solutions to that, prosecute them. Um, Dick Gregory talked about, 
make them all have to be bonded in insurance so that if they do things like this, then they lose their bonding and they can no longer be police officers. Because what happens is a lot of them, they go through this, they go through a trial, they're found innocent, they've lost their job. They just go to another police precinct. I mean, it's, it's, and, and in fact, some of them have become consultants on risk management on how to deal with when you are, you know, in this kind of situation and I'm not making this up. So there's that problem first and foremost. Then you have, okay, you and I have both had jobs. We know who the crazy person is at work, right? <laughs> right. It's, it's not like, you know, somebody went off on a client. Well, we know that. We is. Know. You know, it's, there's no shock. I know enough detectives and sergeants that some of them already know who the crazy person is. Okay, so there's that. But then you also have to look at, you have situations where you have entire precincts or police departments that they have a leader who is that person. And so they created a culture, right? So in 2006, the FBI yeah. released a report that one of the greatest um, dangers and threats to our democracy is that white supremacists have infiltrated police departments and the criminal justice system, right? That was 14 years ago. So if they did that 14 years ago, what positions do they hold now? And so there have to be stronger repercussions. Yet, yeah, are there training issues? Yes, there are training issues. Most police officers get about two hours of training and they're done. So you've got to deal with that. Are there psychological issues that occur from being a police officer that need to be addressed. Absolutely. There's no way that once a police officer is involved in a shooting or stabbing or whatever, that they should not have to go through a psych evaluation, maybe be treated for PTSD. I mean, on my group, you should see the things that the travesties that are sent to me on my group chat or the conversations I've had. I remember I was somebody's not in my group chat. I was talking to him. He's a police officer he was saying, he, he was just like frustrated. He said, dude, I'm so messed up. He said, and we were in a basketball court. He goes, if there are a dead body right there, I wouldn't even notice it. Wow. I'm, just, I'm just so desensitized. So, you know, there's not a simple one prong solution because there has to be empathy for the, the real, there is a legitimate difficult job of being a police officer. The same time, that difficulty doesn't mean that you can tolerate certain types of behavior or mistakes or overstepping of boundaries. And so there has to be a more holistic approach to dealing with it. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but when you were giving that example of what was happening to police officers and they'd get, you know, bonded or, or being able to be a police officer in a different precinct, all I kept thinking about was the Catholic Church and the sexual abuse scandal in the same thing yeah. that had happened where they would just take a priest after a certain instance and they would move them just to another parish. And, and, yeah. and that just ran through my head. And if that if that parallel helps people to connect how serious um, these issues are, maybe maybe that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I, I feel I do feel, though, that maybe it starts at a high level of culture, but there also is a culture of the other officers like, yeah, there's the crazy one in the office. Like this guy's putting his knee on the guy's throat, but there's four other guys around him who are just equally to blame. They should be tasing that officer to get him off. him. I'm just saying that's that's my my yeah. mindset where it's at. And they got to get that correct so they know the guy's down <laughs> you or you could tase the guy if he wants to be down even though he doesn't deserve it um yeah they're they're complicit they're absolutely right. complicit all this being said as in we're all you know me i'm always about moving onward and upward and how we could take everything and learn from it and get better from it um as it relates to your family like you said you've got you had some anger with with with, with your 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 kid was frustrated and, and justifiably like everybody is. Uh, and in having the conversation, you hope that helps. And that you hope is where it gets to. Um, how, how have you been communicating it on whether on your show or in your message, how has this been translating and been filled in? Cause I know how you work. I know how you, you know, you take the real life stuff and try to figure out the lessons and the, the ways we can solve this to bring more awareness to this. But if you could summarize it, is there one bubbling thing that's coming to a head without any sleep? That you've been going through or no? Um, one thing, I don't know if there's one thing. Um, I think that we're at a, a major crossroads, you know, so I'm, I'm both very concerned about our future and very hopeful about our future at the same time. Yeah. Um, we can devolve into the point where 
this is like the falling of the Berlin Wall. That could very easily happen at this stage. Or we could evolve into the point where we have a society that's willing to now start discussing the atrocities of the past and what it takes to become what it needs to be. The thing I've, I am is I'm very pragmatic. I don't use this time to just respond emotionally because that's not effective or helpful. Um, you know, unfortunately, our show is on hold right now because ah. my co-host has some health issues. Nope. And I was even thinking this morning, like, this is the most pivotal, appropriate time for us to be talking. And we're not. Um, it's driving me nuts. That being said, I'm on you know three podcasts a day right now, so I'm making well, up for it. Well, well, but so that's the conversation that's we, that's why we want you on. And when he first of all, wish him well, wish him better. By the way, yeah. you're funnier than he is anyway, on all the, the regular. I, oh, absolutely, and better I mean, looking. Oh well, obviously. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, no. Although brainer. I like I like his hairstyle a little bit more than yours. Just just saying. I mean, you know. Well, you, not you, that's you know. not with the new one, baby. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it is closer to yours. I'll give you that. He and I are a little closer on that front. Yeah, uh, dude, I can't thank you for taking the time here to come on. Um, first of all, get some rest. Second of all, you know, be safe. Let's hope we start getting out and further down the, the progress and uh, from the COVID thing and we start moving along there. You know, you and I feel that from our college kids so that you're not all stuck yep. in the apartment together. Uh, yeah. and, and, and hey, man, I, I'm going to continue having the conversation and, and, I, and I, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your, and your wisdom here too because I know our listeners do appreciate it and it really means a lot. Definitely. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, you know, let's let's maybe even see if we want to in a few weeks circle back around and do a revisit of this as things evolve. And, you know, I'd be more than happy to lend my voice and you know contribute to the show. You know, you're my you know, we're friends way beyond yeah. this stuff. So, um, yeah, look forward to it. But thanks for having me on. You got it, man. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. Keep thriving onward and upward and be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Check us out on the web at thriveloud.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Thrive Loud. And check us out on the Good Pods app at Thrive Loud, where you can follow, listen, and connect directly to Lou and all of the Thrive Loud episodes. Thanks for listening.